I would like to welcome everyone to Wednesday Wellness, a free live educational series presented by Trinity Health Medical Group. Before we turn it over to our presenters, we would like to provide a few reminders. This presentation is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording over the next few days. If you have questions, you can use the Q&A chat, which you will find near the bottom of your screen. Questions will be read aloud and then answered by our presenter. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Angela Ganaim, a cardiologist with Trinity Health Medical Group Cardiovascular. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And I will turn it over to you. Well, hello everyone. So nice to meet you. So sorry for my appearance. Um, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Heart Awareness Month. I tried to do red as best as I could, but apparently I actually don't own anything in red. So that's new. I usually go by Dr. Angela, Dr. Ganame, Dr. G. I'm very informal. Um, so if you see me and you want to ask a question, I'm more than happy to do that. I guess let's kind of get everything started rolling on this. Okay, so today I get the pleasure of kind of talking to you guys about women's cardiovascular health. And it's a topic that I think is coming more and more to the forefront. And it's very, very, very important for everyone. So I guess the, my first slide is, why is it important? Um, heart disease is actually kind of climbing for women. It's the number one issue for women in the United States. In 2021, one out of five women died from heart disease. <laughs> and about only 56% of women actually recognize that there is something wrong with their heart. And to me, to be honest with you, is the scarier part of all this. So we're going to hopefully try to change some of this. So I, the first question I think people ask and when we're talking about it, they're like, what exactly is heart disease? We say it, we don't really know. Most people don't either know or understand what we're looking for or what I'm talking about. So I'm basically talking about anything that affects the way the heart functions, okay? So there's coronary artery disease. That's where you have a blocked artery that can cause a heart attack, Okay. Then also with coronary artery disease, we still have, to have a new syndrome that we've been finding. It's something called microvascular coronary artery disease or microvascular angina, which is where the teeny tiny little baby arteries are the problem. Then we also have something called congestive heart failure. Okay. Congestive heart failure is basically your heart's inability to pump. It just stops pumping the way it should. Okay. And what we as women present at is something with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It can be known as diastolic heart failure. Um, and we, we'll talk about that a little bit more exactly what that is. We also have high blood pressure. And then the last kind of heart disease that I think people don't really know about or kind of know, it's like arrhythmias. And that's just basically what we say when we talk about arrhythmia is what is the problem with how the electrical system works? Okay. So when we talk about heart disease, we talk about risk factors. And the reason why doctors like risk factors is we're, we are trying to prevent this from happening, okay? And if we can modify or have you decrease anything, it's so much better than having the actual disease. So the first thing that's a risk factor is something called hypertension or high blood pressure, which is basically defined as your top number, which is the systolic blood pressure, being higher than 130, and your bottom number, which is called the diastolic blood pressure, being higher than 80, okay? Next one we talk about is high cholesterol. And when we talk about cholesterol, cholesterol is actually something we do in the body and we actually have to have. It actually does a lot of processes in the body. What we are looking for as cardiologists as of right now is talking about the good and the bad cholesterol. So good cholesterol and bad cholesterol are needed because over time, what happens is your body has damage. And the so-called bad cholesterol is there to kind of fix the holes of where the damage is. The good cholesterol is kind of like the guys that you see when they're filling a pothole that try to clean the area up. And it kind of cleans it and makes it smooth in that area. You need both of them to function. And what really what our thing about is disease is that when we see the LDL high is that we know that 
and the HDL low, we know that damage is happening higher than we can actually repair and fix and clean those areas. Another one is diabetes. Diabetes is truly, I think, one of the worst diseases to have. Diabetes is very slow. Diabetes, when we actually make the diagnosis, is about 10 years too late, meaning that you start to have changes from blood sugar issues before diabetes ever really rears its ugly head and you have issues, okay? Then we talk about family history. What does family history mean? I'm looking for something we call as first degree relatives. So I'm looking for what happened to mom? What happened to dad? What happened to your siblings? What happened to your children? Okay, grandma and grandpa are good too, but really we're looking for kind of more of the first degree relatives. Another risk factor that is unique to women because men do not have this is polycystic ovarian syndrome, okay? And what it does is it has irregularity of hormones, which causes you to kind of retain a lot of fat and changes your ability for breaking down sugars and everything because of those hormonal pathways. And that promotes something we call metabolic syndrome and then eventually can lead to something we call diabetes which kind of leads me to my next thing, which is metabolic syndrome, which is basically kind of like a precursor disease before diabetes. A lot of people have this and it's based off of couple syndromes, like based off of what is your bad cholesterol, basically 100 better than 127. It's based off your difference between how big your hips are, okay? It has to do with what's your risk factors for heart disease and what's your blood pressure. Okay, and if we can modify and decrease your metabolic syndrome, that's also good. Smoking. I nicotine use. I think that the medical field as a whole, we've done a really good job at being very aggressive towards kind of decreasing and telling everyone how bad smoking is. Okay, now the thing that's come out in the forefront, just to be kind of blunt, is marijuana and smoking marijuana. There was a study that was just done, published by the AHA kind of looking back at everything and they're saying smoking marijuana in and of itself can also increase heart disease. So not that great either. Um, then we have something called preeclampsia. Now, what is preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is having severely abnormal blood pressure around the time of birth or a little bit six weeks after birth that causes damage to your kidneys. And it's basically due to significantly elevated blood pressure. This, if you have this during one of your pregnancies, this is a risk factor for you to develop coronary artery disease as you get older. The other thing is just gestational diabetes, just kind of what I said before. It's just kind of basically saying you have the risk of starting down this road. Age, as you get older, you have damaged the arteries. That's I, I, there's nothing you can do. It's just, it's a fact of life. And so the older you are, the more likely you are to have heart disease. There is something we call coronary artery calcifications. Okay. And then there is obstructive sleep apnea, which is basically when, so sorry, someone who came in, it's basically when you are not breathing or not taking in enough oxygen as you're sleeping. The way I think of obstructive sleep apnea is and why it causes problems is if someone went to me when I was sleeping and put a pillow over my face, I'm not going to be happy. My blood pressure is going to be high. My heart rate's going to be high. And those things will cause damage. Okay. All right. Next. So the next slide and reason why I kind of glossed over this is kind of talking about what are coronary artery calcifications. As you can see here, this is kind of a picture from one of the journals of medicine. These here are outlines, these bright, 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 bright spots are outlines of something we call coronary artery calcifications. And they look scary. Coronary artery calcifications in and it of itself does not mean that you've had a heart attack, okay? Coronary artery calcifications mean that you have had damage to your heart arteries, okay? And what we do when we have damage to our heart arteries is we put a layer of fat closet on, which is the atherosclerosis or the plaque or the heart attack, okay? That goes down. Over time, because you keep having damage, 
we try to build a stronger wall than just fat. And so we put calcium down. So the calcium doesn't actually have to go inside the hole of it and cause it to shrink. It just can be outside of it. And so what happens is when we see this, we know, hey, over time, you've had a lot of damage to your heart arteries. You are at an increased risk of having a heart attack compared to other people because you've had, we can see damage. Okay. This here, as I said before, we we're kind of talking about it. This is just a kind of a schematic of what plaque looks like in the body. And you can see these little fat deposits here in the, in the artery. That's honestly, coronary artery disease is a natural process. Your body is trying to protect you. The problem with the body is that it doesn't really get the hint to stop building these walls because it keeps getting damaged. And that's where we start to develop symptoms and blockages and can get really sick from all of this. So leading up to that is what are the signs of a heart attack? Now, this has actually been a super big hot topic for quite a while. And the reason why it's a hot topic is actually because of us ladies. And most of the time, women do not have what I'm going to describe in the beginning, which is this left side of chest pressure. A lot of people come to me and they're like, doc, I keep having this sharp pain. It comes and goes super quick. No. Heart pain is not sharp. Heart pain is squeezing. Heart pain is like someone taking you and shoving into your chest or holding you in a bear hug. It's almost like you feel like someone's sitting on you. When you tell me that, I'm immediately more scared. And the reason why it's not sharp, just in case anyone is curious, is that the organs in our body doesn't really, they can't really sense pain. So the pain they give is kind of like obscure. You're like, okay, I guess it's that chest. It's not like pinpoint. If you could pinpoint to something, that's not hard. Um, you can also have, I see there's a question. Um, I'll get to that very shortly. There is shortness of breath. So you can't breathe, especially when you're trying to walk. You get some pain that goes to your left side, up to your neck, usually stopping at the angle of the jaw. Okay. You can sometimes for women specifically, we can get this kind of, and men too, but mostly women, they get this kind of burning sensation in their gut, feeling as if their like esophagus is on fire. They almost mistake it for reflux. You can get nausea. You can get like excessive sweating. You can be short, tired. All of these things, no matter what it is, is triggered by usually by an event. So I'm stressed out about something. I am working or doing something in my garden. And I used to be able to do it fine. And then all of a sudden I can't, okay? And whenever I see something like that, I get scared. Let's see. So this is a really good question. It says, with the coronary calcium scans, can they tell if the calcium is built up on the outside versus the inside of the vessel? No. Mm -mm. So when we get a high-res CT scan, just to look for calcium, it only shows me that the calcium is there. There's something called the coronary CTA. And what it does is it looks at the calcium, but we can do a further test, something called uh, to see if there's a change in function with a certain medication given. But calcium in itself, the way I think about calcium when I'm trying to look at these types of scan is like the brights are on. And I'm driving down like a dark road and I see a car coming towards me. They put their brights on. I don't know the size of the car. I don't know exactly where it's at. I just know I can't see and there's something there. So hopefully that was answered for you. Let's see. All right. All right. Sorry, playing with this now. Okay. So now we talk about something we I was kind of mentioning a little bit, which was microvascular disease. And basically, I think of it as baby vessels versus big vessels. And this kind of here shows you a schematic. And what you see here is the coronary artery. And you probably can't even see my little pointer. Let's see if I can do it this way. Maybe you can see it now. Maybe you can't. But you see it, the big coronary artery, and it kind of leads into this muscle. And these teeny, tiny little bit, and we're talking smaller than a millimeter arteries are the ones that can have disease in them, okay? And so this is unique 
it's we see it in men, but it's very unique to women. Um, and it's something that we are trying to learn how to treat a little bit more. As of right now, the treatment is basically medicines. Okay. And this is diagnosed with people. Someone sometimes a woman will come in, they'll have heart failure, to, I mean heart attack symptoms, and we'll do a heart cath, which is basically we go in an artery and we put a catheter, we kind of take a picture of everything and we see what everything looks like. And if there's no blockages, but they had the event and they had something we call positive markers, which means it shows that the heart is injured, then more than likely they have underlying microvascular disease, okay? The next thing, the other thing could be if you have a symptoms, you have a positive stress test, okay? And stress tests are very nonspecific, meaning what do I mean by that? Basically, I can get a stress test and it, I'm trying to stress your heart enough to see if there's a lack of blood flow problem, okay? And stress test only tells me if there's something really bad, greater like greater than 70%. On the little baby blockages, the stress test does not tell me about. Um, and so if you have a positive stress test and you have symptoms, and then we do a heart cath and there's no arteries blocked, then at that point, you more than likely have microvascular disease. And this is treated once again with medicine and making sure your lifestyle is good and all that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is a super common question. And I get a lot of people refer to me, especially women, men, and they're like, doc, listen, I'm getting older. Like I should not be able to do the things that I were able to do when I was 20. Yeah, you shouldn't. <laughs> I'm not comparing to that. You have to compare apples to apples. So what I usually tell people, I go, all right, I want you to compare yourself year to year. How is it when you go up a flight of stairs? I mean, for most of us, and I am not going to lie to you, it's not easy going up a flight of stairs. <laughs> is it getting worse? Is it getting better? What's going on? How am I when I walk the grocery store? Do I have to stop a couple of times? Um, is there something wrong? Do I have to ask people for help? Um, is like any activity that you do, if, our, if you mow the lawn, if you do, do the snow, if you garden, whatever it is, it's comparison year to year, not year to 10 years. Okay. Then the next question is, okay, so let's just say you're like, you know what? I really want to start exercising. I notice I'm short of breath. Am I dying? Good question. Cause it feels like it, especially cause I started exercising and yeah, I do feel sometimes like I'm dying. <laughs> um, so initially, whenever you start, it's going to be terrible. Okay. But what I tell people is give yourself four to six weeks of consistent exercise. I don't care what it is, four to six weeks of some type of movement, whether you're going from not moving at all to doing five minutes a day to something else. And if you don't improve or it gets worse, something is wrong. Don't write it off. Okay. And just keep in mind that we are, I am personally very well aware, and I think a lot of doctors are female, and a lot of things are coming to the forefront that we do, do a, like to do a term called gaslighting, which basically tells you that your symptoms aren't real, it's a hormonal, it's anxiety or whatever. If something is wrong and you truly believe it, something is probably wrong. Sometimes we doctors are not able to diagnose it, and I'm sorry for my profession. Next question. Why did this happen to me? As I've kind of explained before, like this is normal. Like your body is trying to do its best to protect you in whatever way possible, okay? You get damaged in everyday life. It just, it does not, it does not get the hint. It does not get the hint. So basically kind of all of our strategies about doing something is to try to decrease any of the damage you have. Kind of switching gears a little bit because I did want to kind of touch on every specific topic. Um, I'm going to switch gears in your mind and we're going to go to something called congestive heart failure, okay? And I just want you to remember that congestive heart failure is something called pump failure. When I think of the heart working as a pump, I think of the heart having two functions. It's got a squeezing function and it's got ability to relax and fill with blood, Okay. The relaxing to fill with blood, I think if its ability is to fill like a cup, all right, 
the pumping function is like the squeezing function. That's the one you think of strength. That's the one you think of if someone's lifting weights, like that's the one. But remember, because the blood, the heart has to transfer blood, it also has to fill with blood at some point. Okay. And that's called diastole. And then there's systolic dysfunction. Most of the time, most women are diagnosed with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure. And basically what that means is your heart's ability to fill like a cup is abnormal. What the heck? The way I think about it too is like, let's just say we have someone and we start filling the cup, right? And we keep filling and filling and filling, but the cup is not able to take as much as it was. Instead of having a nice big cup that you had before, all of a sudden it's a smaller cup. If you put the same amount of blood in or pressure in, what's gonna happen? It's gonna overflow. When it overflows, that's when it causes problems. That's when it causes symptoms. That's when people don't feel good, okay? So what are the signs of heart failure? This is a sign of the cup overfilling. You can have bad swelling in your legs. Now people, are, people have lymphedema, which basically means that your junk system that tries to clear everything out is not able to do so. So it just kind of pulls in your legs, okay? You also have people have venous insufficiency, meaning that the veins that are supposed to take your blood from your toe to your heart can't do it anymore, okay? And so that causes blood to kind of pull in the legs. But if this comes out of nowhere and it seems very odd, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about swelling in the legs. All of a sudden, you notice you're more short of breath. Notice everything I've kind of said for the heart is very, it could be related to the lung, could be related to the heart. And the fact that you're not able to walk like you used to. You notice that, you know, like you're like this grocery store thing is my favorite one because I don't know of anyone who doesn't go to the grocery store. Um, you're just not able to do it. Okay. Rapid weight gain. And I know as women, we tend to fluctuate. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like all of a sudden you look and like you've gained 10 pounds in a week period and your legs are swelling and you're having all these symptoms then I would be concerned that there's something underneath called congestive heart failure, okay? You can't sleep laying flat. All of a sudden, you're in a chair. You're in your bed, but you're using like a million, a gajillion pillows, okay? That's a sign that maybe there's something going on. Another one is, Doc, I'm gaining tons of weight. Like, and, I, and I'm not meaning like a couple pounds, like as I said, like 10, 20, 30 weight pounds, and you're not eating anything. And I'm not talking about in a, year period of time, I'm talking about in a month period of time. That's a problem. Next question is how do we treat heart failure? So it really depends on the type of heart failure. There are some things that we are consistent. The one that I'm going to be talking about with treating for is the one that's specific to women. Um, if anyone needs me to either come back or touch on it, the other one, I'd be more than happy to do so, but I'm going to talk about this first. So the thing about heart failure is we have to watch our salt intake and you have to do something called a heart failure diet. Why do we have to watch our salt intake? First reason, the American diet, we do like tons of salt, way, way, way more salt than we need, okay? And we put in a lot of things as preservatives and stuff like that, that we just don't even know about, okay? The other reason is that when you have salt, it is, there's when you have heart failure, your blood pressure is monitored and changed by how much salt you have in your body. If there is too much salt in the body, the blood pressure will go up for these people and then they can go into heart failure. I'm trying to explain it and I know it sounds kind of like abstract. Um, if we need, once again, if I, we need to go over it again or someone wants another question, I'm more than happy to answer it. So what we do when people start to retain water is we give them water pills, Lasix, Busey, Torsamide. These are pills that basically make you pee. And about in a half hour to an hour after you're taking it, you should be running to that bathroom cursing my name, okay? And they usually it's about six hours. And after that, you should be okay. Um, now we're kind of really all about this medication called Forsiga. This is a kind of works almost like a water pill. And what it does is it basically makes you pee out sugar and it will help get rid of fluid that way. Touched on this in the beginning, but controlling your blood pressure, making sure your meds are optimized, making sure that you're not, you're not having crazy spikes, okay? Control of your diabetes. 
Just like if we needed the that other pill to kind of help water get out, if your sugars are too high, you want to retain water. Diabetes also in the excess sugar, because we can't put it into the cell, will damage the heart, okay? Stop smoking, right? Smoking is bad. It causes constriction of your vessels. It causes damage to your vessels. And when that damage does, it will cause your heart having difficulty in how to pump. And then watching how much total fluid you drink. What does this really mean? People always get like super weirded out by this question because you're like, you dox, you want me to drink fluid, then you don't want me to drink fluid. The long story short, when it comes to heart failure, what I'm trying to get you to do is to pee out more than what you take in. That's it. That's the basic concept. So we usually kind of restrict how much fluid you have, which is usually, I would say, I always give people, I'm generous and I say 64 ounces, which is four 16 ounce bottles that you can get from Costco, okay? Um, and then making sure you watch your weight. And as a woman myself, I don't like to watch my weight, but in heart failure, unfortunately, this is something you have to do, okay? And it's really important because that will help us determine how we're going to be doing your water pills. Now, shifting things again. I see that there's a question. Let me see. Uh, so there's a question over here. Um, it says, I've been a type 1 diabetic for 44 years, keeping my blood glucose well controlled. What do you suggest to keep my heart strong besides watching sugar, salt, staying way hydrated, and exercising? So really, some of the other things is making sure that you're taking your medications and watching your cholesterol. So diabetes, as I talked about before, is a very difficult disease. And as a type one, it's even more difficult for you poor guys. It's terrible. Um, usually we have you sometimes on this medication called a statin medication. And what the statin medications do is it helps to decrease your bad cholesterol, but it also helps to stabilize any of those darn plaques that are in there. So they don't want to break off and cause problems for people. In fact, it kind of helps to be like, okay, let's either decrease it or make it so that it is calcium so it doesn't move. Um, anything, hopefully that helped answer your question. I think I did that one. Done. So I'm just trying to clean up shop so I don't miss anyone's questions when they come in because I'm not that good at it. Okay. Kind of flipping and... If you have more questions about it, please ask again, or if you felt like I didn't answer your question. Okay, so I'm gonna get to these couple ones at the end, just so I can run through this, but I see both of them, okay? So, why the first question here, this, so the next year I'm going to kind of flip over to why do I have bl high blood pressure? As I said before, age, and it just happens. Your weight, why is it weight? Why are we doctors always hyping on weight? I'm a chubby lady. Son, there, I'm sure there are some chubby ladies listening. We're not trying to be mean, okay? It comes off like we're terrible people. I get it because I've already been on that end and I'm like, why are you so rude? It's not about the weight. What it is, is the way I think about weight is like basically like a physical weight in your hand, okay? Your heart is a muscle. If your heart has to pick up a five pound weight, if your arm picks up a five pound weight, it's fine. If it has to pick up a 50 pound weight, that causes damage. That causes the muscle to get bigger. We don't really want that to happen to the heart because as I said, it has to feel like a container. So we want to have more space in there. So the less weight you are, the less power and energy that the heart has to do in order to make sure that you can move your body and live your life. We're, I promise we're not trying to be mean. It just comes off super rude. Um, you can have hormonal issues, stress, menopause, thyroid. You can have issues with blocked arteries to your kidneys. You can just have the genetics, like them's the breaks. And then you can have something we call white coat hypertension, which is basically you come in, you see a doc and you freak out. I see a doc, I freak out too. Here's the issue. Freak, a little bit of freak out is fine. 
when I see people who have white coat hypertension, I am suspicious that you are going to start developing things. Why do I think this way? If normal stress is, I go from maybe a blood pressure of 120 to maybe 140, maybe on the outside 150 tall, okay? If your blood pressure is going from 120 to 200, there is a problem. More than likely you have abnormal issues in your arteries and stuff like that, or more abnormal nerves and stuff like that, that's just causing the high blood pressure. And that's just how you are. So it is a sign that more than likely you've developed something underneath. How do I present these things? We kind of touched on it. Someone asked a question, which was very good. Exercise. I don't really care the exercise. I'm being completely frank. Move, walk, Pilates, yoga, Tai Chi. There's like this one weird one that has to do with like energy movements. There's like, this is like, there's so many different things. There's like, just pick something that you think that you're able to do. The more you're able to do, the better off you are. Um, as I said before, she once again, she touched on it, exactly what I'm going to say. Control high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, healthy diet. There are so many, <laughs> there are so many diets out there. <laughs> um, the diet that's considered the bee's knees right now in the heart world is the Mediterranean diet, which is basically kind of fish, chicken, making sure you're having your healthy oils like olive oil, doing some like your nuts, um, having a lot of green leafy vegetables, that kind of stuff. My opinion on diet is as long as you're eating well and you're not getting a lot of processed foods and you're watching the amount of simple carbs, like in having a good balanced diet, you should be fine, okay? Weight loss, as I said before, and I, trust me, like I get you. Like, you don't want me to be told to lose weight. You've been told like five million times. I get you. I feel you. But if you drop your weight by 15 to 20%, you will drop your blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury. So the top number will go down. The bottom number by five. It's not, it, it's just kind of like, a, and if you're a healthy, if you're obese and your blood pressure is good and you're able to walk and run and do things and your labs are good, awesome. That's great. BMI is not a total risk factor for everything. But if you are super, I'm like on the excess side, the heavy, that can be a problem over time. And we're finding that more and more. My 600 pound life kind of touches on it, but people have, can go into bad heart failure because of that. Um, so all we're saying is be careful, watch what you're doing, make sure you're eating healthy, make sure you're doing exercise. If you want to do something, then then make sure that you have the ability to do it. And that by having the ability to do it is by trying that thing and seeing how it goes. Last one, managing stress. I I know it's dumb that I put this in here. <laughs> I like there's nothing to do to manage stress that's easy. There's consideration of meditation or mindfulness. Now I'm getting like hoo hoo, I get it. But if you in there sometimes you will not be able to manage stress. You just can't. Life happens, stress happens. But if you can find a way to find little moments to kind of decompress in healthy manners, that will also help you with your heart health. You can't have a car that runs at 100 miles per hour. Eventually, it's gonna break down. So if you if you can find any way, and I, once again, it's not easy. I, I don't even, I find it hard to do it myself. But if there's some moments in the day that you could take to try to decompress and learn how to deal with it, the better it's going to be. Kind of switching gears one more time. Once again, I do see those questions. I will get to get to at the end. I did want to touch on this because I do get a lot of women who come in with palpitations. A lot of dudes too, but more women than men. I mean, so an arrhythmia is an abnormal heartbeat electrical conduction thing. When I think about the heart, we talked about how the, there's the pumping function. Well, the electrical system basically tells the pumping system what to do, okay? Just like any kind of like thing that we see today, like a washing machine or everything, you put the buttons and that's the electrical system and then it tells what the mechanical system to do, okay? Palpitations is a feeling of racing heart. 
and anything can cause it. If you come to any doctor, me or anyone else, the first questions we're going to ask you is dehydration, caffeine, chocolate, alcohol, anxiety, sleep issues, vitamin deficiencies. Um, are you on any stimulant medications? Are you taking any weight loss supplements? Like we're going to ask you that because those are the easiest things to get rid of to see what's going on. And there's no reflection on you. We don't think you're bad. We're just trying to, we know that these will cause that feeling because the heart feels as if it has to move more, but that doesn't mean it's actually doing it. Um, when do I know something is wrong? If you pass out. If someone in your family died for no apparent reason and no one knows why and you're having these symptoms, that's a little scary. You should be checked out. Um, if you have other issues at the time of the palpitations, like shortness of breath or chest pressure when it happens. My long story short on this is I really do want y'all to seek help when you need it. Don't be afraid. Don't let us docs gaslight you. If there's a problem, find a solution. Talk to people. Controversial opinion. If you need a second opinion, you need to get a second opinion. But find a doctor that's going to help and work with you and be and do whatever we can to help you. Okay. And that's kind of it on the presentation. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ganame. We do have some time left over that we can handle some more questions. I know that there are several that have been dropped into the Q&A. As a reminder, those little, they almost look like little speech bubbles are located near the bottom of the, your screen and they are labeled Q&A. Please drop your questions in there. And again, they will be read aloud and Dr. Graham will try to answer those. <clears throat> Dr. Graham, if I can please read these questions to you, I'd be happy yeah, to please. do that Sorry, some of them were happening during them and no the attention of a squirrel, so I apologize. <laughs> no problem. We actually did receive a question via email yesterday. Oh. And I wonder if you would be able to answer it. Yeah. And the question was, what would be the top three tips or recommendation for women to make improvements to, to improve their heart health by decade? So ages 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Good question. So first thing that I would recommend I think that anything good comes starting from diet and everyone is going to be like, oh, I've heard this before, but in order to have good things happen to you, you have to put good things into your body. You don't want to build a house with broken materials. You want to build a house with nice, thick wood. You don't want anything like a broken thing, anything rotten. So the better the food that you can take in, the more likely your life is to be extended. The next thing, I say this adage to my patients all the time. If you do not move, you will lose. If you do not use something, you will lose the ability, okay? If you do not walk, you will lose the ability to walk. If you do not, whatever it is, you will lose the ability to do that. So doing some way or some form of just walking consistently I notice that more, a lot of my patients who tend to do well into their 80s or 90s are people who are like, I'm still doing this, 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 this. Even the far, my farmers who come in and they're working and doing all this stuff, it's still, I'm doing a lot of stuff, okay? The last thing, hmm, that's a good one. I don't even know what my third one would be. I mean, like I can give a really kind of like, oh, follow your doctor's advice, which obviously I'm going to support. Um, but. I would say that if you're able to use or find and deconstruct cell uh, stress in a healthy way, that's going to be, I think, the most life achieving for you. So those are my three. Thank you so much. Another question, and I think this might have been a follow up from one that was covered during the presentation. Is how would I know if I have plaque? That's a super good question. So. Plaque and blockage are kind of synonymous. We only are able to do really good testing, like stress testing on people who have symptoms. There's a test, it's called the coronary CTA. 
And what it does is it does that procedure that's called the left heart cath to kind of take a look in the arteries without doing the actual heart cath, okay? This test is not really indicated for everyone. And I'll be honest with you, most of the time, we really only do tests, once again, if you have a symptom. So could you be sitting on a plaque and not know it? Unfortunately, yes. If you had symptoms, then we could proceed maybe with this coronary CTA, which would be to take a look. But the only way to truly know if you have plaque is for us to literally look at the plaque. Thank you. This next question is a little bit of a longer question, so please bear with me. When my husband turned 50, his doctor had him do several baseline tests to determine the health of his cardiovascular system. He did not have any family history, with the exception of high cholesterol. But when I turned 50, I asked about a baseline test and was told that the insurance company no longer allows for such preventative tests testing, especially since I have no family history and I don't smoke. I exercise regularly, etc. Yet it's still the silent killer. Is there truly no longer stress testing of the heart as a preventative? So here's the deal. Unfortunately, you are correct. For insurance companies and really for most of medicine, we, for stress testing is okay, but not preventative. And here's why it's kind of fallen out of favor. What can happen, and I'm not saying that everyone has this, but unfortunately I have seen some cases of this where I will order a stress test or someone I know will order a stress test from one of their patients, and then they'll come in with a heart attack and everyone will be like, the stress test is negative. The stress test only looks and can find blockages greater than 70%. The little baby blockages, the like 10%, 20%, it can't see. So as a preventative tool, it's not, for prevention, it's not helpful. For diagnosis, it is. Thank you. Next question. Does menopause affect cholesterol, specifically yes. the LDL? Okay. And how can you decrease that number? Um, so <laughs> menopause, I didn't touch on it quite a lot because I think a lot of the hormonal balances on menopause, we don't really understand. What I can tell you is that as a female, once menopause hits, all of a sudden we lose our project, like our protective hormones, like progesterone and estrogen. And we race, race to catch up with the guys. Okay. Um, it doesn't, as I've seen, sometimes actually affect LDL in and of itself. I've seen some people who eat like it does it. LDL, I mean, like specifically getting the number to LDL to call it decrease is really just, as I said, decreasing the damage if you can. So making sure you're healthy um, and if needed, starting a medication called a statin to lower that number. Thank you. <clears throat> This next question is a term question, and I think you mentioned it a few times in your presentation, but could you refresh everyone's memory on what does gaslighting mean? Oh, yeah. Um, so gaslighting is a, a term that I think maybe it's a millennial term. Maybe it's a Gen Z's term. I don't know. But long story short, what it means is that you come in, you talk to someone, okay, and you say to them, I have this problem. And instead of actually taking you seriously and digesting what you've told them and really paying attention, they don't. They either write it off or say that everything is fine, okay? Instead of really paying attention to what you're saying. And this is kind of prevalent, I think, for women especially. Um, so that's what gaslighting means, unless someone has a better definition. If you ask me and I say gaslighting or I hear it that way, that's what I say. Thank you so much. Next question. At night, my heart feels like it's racing, but when I stand up, it seems to go away. This only happens at night. Well, so that's kind of an interesting one. And <laughs> you're not the first person I've told who has this kind of issue with a racing heart. And 
if you were in front of me, I'd ask you kind of like clarifying questions, which basically is, do is it feel like it's racing or do you actually check your pulse and put your hand on it and you can feel it going super fast, okay? Sometimes that feeling of palpitations when we lay down and our system is trying to settle, for some reason, our nervous system is kind of unequal. And I think our blood balance is trying to shift back to where it should. And so people get this kind of racing heart feeling and it doesn't always mean anything to everyone. And then as soon as they set, set up, everything goes away. So it could be fine. If you're really worried about it or you're finding it that it's super fast or something, I would recommend a monitor or getting kind of a closer look. Um, there are some of these monitors you can actually get from, I think, Target is where I tell people and it's called the Cardia. And so if you have that, you can literally turn around a bit, put your fingers on it, get an EKG, bring it into your doctor and be like, what's this? Thank you. Next one is, I'm experiencing side effects with statins. Are there any vitamins that the statins may deplete that I should be keeping my eye on, which may help the side effect? Though, though, actually, so I didn't bring this up because I didn't talk about statins in too much detail. This is actually a really good question. I actually tell my people to talk, take something called coenzyme Q10, and they take 200 milligrams. Also, if you're taking a statin as a preventative matter or because your cholesterol is high, there are statin, there are different types of statins and they're kind of absorbed in different ways. And sometimes switching the type of statin can also help. All right, next question. Um, this person has a moderate calcium score. Mm -hmm. What would you want to do as the next step? Cholesterol is okay. LDL borderline. HDL is excellent. They know that diet and exercise and they're trying to stay away from statin. Uh, okay. So with people with a moderate calcium score, I the, the only benefit I really see is diet, exercise, and telling me if you're having symptoms. And once again, I, I do want to just clarify, it's a year to year process. So I, it's really important for you to kind of make sure that you're not having anything that's subtle. And I think that's honestly where people get in trouble the most is that they have these kind of subtle, I'm a little short of breath, but I think it's fine. Or I'm just a little bit more tired and I just have to rest a little bit more, but I think it's fine. If it's not going away or getting worse, there's probably something there. And then maybe we need to do a stress test to see if you truly have something functionally wrong. So there's that one. Thank you. Next one is, why is chocolate bad for the heart? <laughs> oh, isn't that sad? It makes me so sad. Um, chocolate is sad. It's, so chocolate in itself, in a high percentage is not bad in that I, here's my thing. Anything done in moderation is okay. All right. Like if you're having a small serving size, that's fine. Most people don't do that. I don't do that. So I don't like most people to do chocolate with a lot of sugar in it is not good for you. But if you're only having a small piece and you are not a diabetic, then it should not be an issue. Why does it cause this palpitation feeling? It just works as a stimulant on your hormone receptors in your heart. And so it makes it feel like everything has to move faster. Thank you. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on an annual outside screening, such as Lifeline, et cetera? Wondering if they're worth doing, or is it best to have an annual screening done with a licensed professional? Super good question. I do see these annual screenings all the time. Here's my thought on it. If you feel more secure on getting the annual screenings, that's completely fine with me. If you want to pay out of pocket and you think it's not too bad, that's completely fine with me. Um, I would say that the only thing about happening with a live screening is that you have to make sure that some type of doctor is following and getting your results because you just getting the results is great, but and I, once again, I'm not trying to be mean, but you don't exactly know what you're looking for. So if you were to bring that result to a physician, 
then that would help out for your situation. I Do I hate them? No. I mean, I don't think they're bad. Sometimes I, I have had people who found something and they're worth knowing. Like there was a bad blockage that we didn't know about or the, that they didn't know about. And they all of a sudden refer to see me because of that. Sometimes it's, they get you a little excited and there's nothing really wrong. So just making sure that whenever you're getting these type of testing, you're kind of going back to your physician. I know it's kind of like an ambivalent answer, but I feel that's helpful. All right. The next one is, what would be the best, you kind of touched on this, but what would be the best exercise plan for heart health? So, you know what, it's kind of funny that you talk about this. Um, and this is a good question. They actually recently, the AHA just released something saying that you should be doing more weight related exercise on top of doing cardio. My personal opinion is any motion is good motion. If you're starting from doing nothing, walk. Walk. Don't care. Just walk. Start walking. Get up to like 20, 30 minutes a day and continue to walk. If you wanted to add something else, like a little either weight training or Pilates or core exercise or something, you could. Um, and AHA is recommending, I think, some light weight training type stuff. But in my, once again, my personal opinion on whenever it comes to like doing exercise, whatever is going to get you moving, do it. And if you could do it three times a week, awesome. Thank you. We have had a few mentions of side effects with statins. So this question is going to kind of pull all of those together. Are there any long-term negative effects from taking the statin, i.e. memory loss, hair loss, anything else? So statin, the memory loss thing was not truly correlated, meaning that the study wasn't done on people taking statins and looking at specifically memory. It was kind of going back and picking people who were on statins and then they had memory loss. As a factor of age in Alzheimer's disease and something we call vascular dementia, meaning there's blockages in your little arteries in your brain that can cause issues, people can have memory loss and those people are usually on statin therapy. So do I believe actually that people have memory loss with statins? No. And that's something that's kind of scared a lot of people. Um, things that are true side effects are muscle aches. People have had bad, bad muscle aches from rhabdomyosis, from that. And that can cause, uh, can cause muscle breakdown for some people. Um, doesn't always though. The other one that can be super scary on statin, I'm not really selling statins right now. Sorry. <laughs> um, one of the other things that can be super scary with statin medications not really super scary, but kind of interesting is that it will, sometimes it's ironic, but sometimes it can cause issues with blood sugar and kind of worsening of diabetes. I don't really know, I'll be honest and frank with you, I don't really know the pathology behind that, but I do know that that does happen to some people. And I don't, I think it's just because it regulates a different system. Um, but once again, I'm not going to continue to commenting on it exactly as why it happened since I, I have not read on it. Um, but that's kind of only known for true long-term issues with statin therapy. Thank you. This next question is, <clears throat> if your cholesterol is out of range on the high side, but good, you have good blood pressure, when should you start taking cholesterol medication? So there are some people who are born because of their genes that their cholesterol is so high and unmeasurable, okay? And unfortunately for you people, you do need to start actually pretty early. Um, sometimes it even requires multiple drug therapy. Why does that happen? For some reason, your genes just make it so you produce more of the fat molecules. And just because you are doing healthy doesn't mean that it can't unfortunately cause problems. Your genes are just not good at regulating it. So it causes mass hysteria in your body. So Usually for these people, if it's not measurable and everything, they start you on medication early. Thank you. Next question, I think is somewhat related to a previous question. 
but what is your opinion on wearables to track or monitor heart rate, AFib, like the Fitbit uh, or the so Another thing, I actually, I think I was either just watching it or talking about it. So your watches are actually not that sensitive or specific. And what I, 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 I wear a smartwatch. Um, do I know that it's not the best for heart rate? Yes. Does it kind of give me some, a little bit of comfort sometimes? Um, so the wearables, they're not a hundred percent great, but it, sometimes if you're wearing them and you're noticing a problem and you're actually also having symptoms and stuff with it, it's kind of worth it for you to have, at least it will give us kind of an idea and be like, okay, well, Maybe we need to do that. Maybe we need to get a different type of monitor that we can read as the cardiologist and look at what the actual electricity is doing in the heart because these little watches don't do that. Thank you. We have time for just a few more questions. If for any reason that we don't get to all of the questions that have been submitted, we will collect those and send them to Dr. Gunaim and ask that she answers them and we will include them in the follow-up email that goes out. So while we still have time, let's get to a couple of more. Dr. Gunaim, are you accepting new patients? Yeah, 100%. All right, and then kind of along with that, does Trinity Health Medical Group Cardiovascular require a referral? Wow, that's a good question. I'm pretty sure. So I think it actually has to depend on your insurance company. Um, some insurances require that you have a, a referral and I do believe Medicare does some insurances. Um, I think Blue Cross Blue Shield might be one of them will allow you to schedule an appointment without a referral. So it's not really kind of based on us so far as I know, unless you ladies know something different. And honestly, you may want to talk to my office manager because I'm just the doctor. <laughs> They're smarter than me on these. Um, and but as far as I know, like referral, usually depending on insurances, otherwise you could probably see them on your self-request. We would be happy to include that piece of information in our follow-up email, as well as how to contact Dr. Gunaim's office. All right, let's see if we can get one more question, at least one more question in here. And before we close for the rest of the afternoon, and it says, this one spe is a specific question. It says, my father had a stress test done and passed his test. The next day had a massive heart attack. He had a, had a quad bypass done. His blockages were 80 to 90%. Why would the stress test not detect this? This is such a good question. It's funny because I was kind of following along with you as you were answering um, questions. And I saw this one and I was kind of hoping you were going to ask it of me. So I'm kind of glad you did. It depends on the type of stress test. But long story short, and, and since he had a quad bypass, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that your father probably had a test called a nuclear stress test. And what that does is the stress test looks at how blood flows within the heart muscle. Why is this important? If the blood flow in the heart muscle is equal because all the vessels are bad, we will not see anything. Because the blood flow looks normal in rest or stress because everything's bad still. If there's one artery that's more than the other, then we can see that there's a lack of blood flow. But if everything is bad everywhere, when you stress it, everything just looks normal. That's why stress tests, We are, sometimes we also have to take in context as a cardiologist, um, depending on what's going on. But th that's more than, I feel about 95% comfortable in saying that's probably the stress test that was done for your loved one. Thank you so much. We are going to end our question and answer just because we, it is one o'clock. And if there is any question that we did not get to, again, we will download those questions and provide them to Dr. Ghanayim to answer. We will include those answers in our follow-up email. That follow-up email will also include a link to this presentation. The recording will include the Q&A portion. 
And we will also make sure that it includes information on how to request an appointment with Dr. Ghanaim, as well as if a referral is needed. So thank you so much, Dr. Ghanaim. It was a wonderful presentation. We had lots of really great comments about how much everyone learned. Um, we would also like to thank everyone who joined us today. Yeah, thank um, you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. And we hope that you are able to join us for our next Wednesday Wellness presentation, which is on February 21st at 7 p.m. Dr. Joshua Greenberg, a vascular sur surgeon, will be presenting on vascular health. Health, understanding the importance of your artery and vein wellness. So thank you again. And we hope that you have a great rest of your day.